Hello and welcome to Inside Nova Quark, episode 3, the podcast about all things dual universe and the people who craft it. I'm Nomad, committee manager, and your host again today. To be more precise, I'll be co-hosting this podcast with NQ Wizard, our social media manager in Montreal. Indeed, for the first time, this episode has been recorded on both sides of the Atlantic. So, on this show today, we will review the Alpha 2 launch. We'll talk a bit about Alpha 3 and how production in our new offices ramps up. That includes a few details about some new features and some polish on existing ones. We'll talk about the puzzle building contest we organized and we'll also answer some questions from the community. So, I hope you're ready. We're going to Montreal, so strap in. Thank you, thank you Nomad for introducing me. Today I'm joined with JC, who is the CEO, Creative Director, uh, Dual Universe Overlord. <laughs> yeah, hello, son. <laughs> Stefan, General Manager. Hi there, guys. And NQ Drifter, producer of Dual Universe. Hi, guys. Welcome. Uh, this is actually our first podcast in the Montreal studio, so this is very exciting. Um, I wanted to talk to you about you know, Alpha 2, the release of it and things that are coming up in the future. So, JC, uh, with the update to release this past July, which introduced new features and improvements to existing features, I wanted to ask you about looking back at the Alpha 2 launch. Yeah, well, it's been a few months now, but um, it's been a kind of a bumpy start, the Alpha 2. We had the technical issues because mainly we introduced a new, uh, new very important part of the system, which is the queuing system that allows uh, you know, to uh, filter and regulate the entry of new players in the game. And this system uh, didn't work as intended, so we had to fix it actually during the launch itself. Uh, this is uh, still developed at the moment and it's improving. So th this was, you know, the main uh, feedback of Alpha 2 is to introduce this part. Um, on the, the load itself, uh, we did, as you remember, probably in March, we've done a, a pretty impressive experiment with 30,000 uh, simulated players plus real players uh, that shows that uh, we, we're confident on maintaining the load. Uh, but the the big work, you know, that comes from the Alpha 2 uh, launch on the tech side is to you know work on this queuing system. Uh, apart from that, I mean, there's been uh, a bunch of new gameplays introduced, and uh, we're going to talk uh, today, I think, about all the new stuff we have uh, installed besides the technology, but on the gameplay uh, for Alpha 3. That's great. I'm always excited to hear what's new coming new in Alpha 3 and in Dual Universe. Um, so, what have the teams been working on, and you know, what can we be expecting in the upcoming months? For Montreal, well, let's do a recap about Montreal. Uh, we are now we have moved into our new offices uh, since about th three weeks, uh, which was uh, which is great because previously uh, we were in a temporary uh, renting uh, place where which is is fine. But when you find your own home where you can, you know, really stick the flag in the ground and saying this is this is our our space. You that mean the territory unit? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Almost one kilometer uh, of uh, radius. Um, but we're in the downtown uh, downtown Montreal in a very good location. Uh, it was very important for me to find something that was accessible for our employees to come, you know, I, I did want to reduce as much as possible. The, the transit has to be easy to come to work and to leave back to home. Uh, that's That once uh, that location was identified, uh, you need to beautify the interior because it was not exactly a, a gaming uh, studio. Um, so I think my role was to do this all in a very f uh, short lapse of time so because we wanted to move in as soon as possible so it was a fast track um, construction site just as the uh, the game as I may uh, do a comparison but uh, the results are great I think people are uh, very satisfied I mean we have senior developers that have been working in different uh, major studios in Montreal. Uh, the, the studios in Montreal are uh, very, very nice. And uh, how, how many people uh, do we have uh, right now? Right now, we're at the, the, the head count is 37. So 37. 37 and I mean, that, that was the you know big challenge uh, once we decided to uh, open the Montreal office. The, 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 the core idea was that 
going to Montreal where there is so much of the gaming industry there will help us to ramp up a large number of experienced people in a short time. And you totally delivered on that, uh, Stefan. Yes. 37 yeah. in such a short period of time. Um, most of these people, I mean, not most, but some of them, you know, they already worked with each other. Yeah. So, you know, they know each other well, they can, they can function properly. Uh, so this this is a, a great achievement. We are now in September, and we have a working, you know, a production unit here in Montreal that will help tremendously accelerate, you know, the pace at which we can uh, yeah. ship stuff. And the recruitment uh, process was really important. Even though we were in a fast track, we didn't want to cut the corners too much. Meaning that uh, we might have interviewed five or six great candidates. Mm -hmm. But we needed to find. We wanted to find the candidate that had the right skills, uh, technical skills, but also social skills. I mean, we wanted people to be able to work together. Uh, sometimes there's uh, people that are uh, have great experience. Um, they're good at working in their bubble, and they're they they are not exactly team players. And that's more frequent than we might think in the video game. But since um, we wanted to be a small tiger team-ish mentality. You need to find the people that are ready to work together. No prima donnas, no ego. The best idea wins. And so we, we were able to, to find uh, those qualities among the 37 people that are here. And that, that's especially important since they have to interact with the team in Paris as well a lot, which, uh, I mean, the, this comes with a few cultural differences. So being a team player is even more important. Yeah. So maybe if we uh, get back to Alpha 3 and what we're doing for Alpha 3 now that Stefan has gotten us a great team and made us nice and comfortable, uh, there are three main structural focus points basically for Alpha 3. There is one part which is just finishing the structural features. Uh, Alpha 2 came with uh, quite a few gameplay features, but the main ones were structural as well. It was industry, which is basically just kickstarting economy and mass production, and it was also the talent system, which is, uh, I mean, now that we have the talent system, which is the main progression system for characters, uh, every single feature just integrates with it. So it, it had to come first because it was very structural. So following up on these structural features, now we have organizations and uh, right systems and ownership and all that, uh, all the structure sim systems that are going to allow you guys to basically play together in a structured way and uh, to, to safeguard you from, um, uh, to safeguard you from, from any ex exploits uh, and basically harassing that you, you might get if you didn't have this structure. Uh, so that's basically the first part. JC, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, that? just 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 uh, one word is to say that uh, there've been a lot of features uh, shipped in Alpha 2 that were not final that uh, we are heavily polishing uh, in Alpha 3. So uh, the industry, for example, maybe you noticed that uh, uh, the recipes were uh, basically placeholders. They were just uh, you know uh, introducing the logic, but. Uh, they are going to be revamped, and uh, you will see also uh, changes in the UI. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of things that are going to be improved. Yeah, exactly. That's basically point number two. So first one was uh, finishing structural features for Alpha 3, and then the second one, as JC just mentioned, is basically polish. Uh, we're getting back to our core gameplay features, so there is uh, these structural features like industry that are going to get some polish, but we are also going to put a lot of effort into polishing, uh, building uh, functionalities and mining and piloting and all the core features we have right now. And the final focus uh, on the road to Alpha 3 is, of course, the final major gameplay feature we want to implement, which is PvP which we are putting a lot of effort into and which is quite huge. Yeah, yeah. PvP, well, we, we call this iteration PvP Lite, uh, that is meant to introduce the, you know, the fundamental mechanics of PvP. There will be literally unlimited amount of things we could do in the future to you know, go beyond that. Uh, but this is, this is just the first stone uh, that we put uh, and I'm personally very excited because uh, what I've seen so far is, is extremely promising. 
yeah, it's uh, it's not exactly clear how much of PvP and uh, how much polish it's going to be for Alpha 3, but uh, the groundwork is coming together. It's a lot of technical challenges as well. I mean, having real PvP, which is actually going to break parts of your ship and damage voxels, and I mean, yeah, that's, that's the kind of stuff that's never been done at this scale before, so it's a lot of effort, and uh, yeah, there is a lot of focus on that right now. Yeah, without disclosing any secret, I can just announce that uh, I think last week we had the first major battle in the prototype of the PvP going on inside uh, the company, so that was quite epic. You had all the employees <laughs> fighting each other, so that well, that actually got us sort of reassured that we have something very interesting in our hands. Uh, so, sorry, I stopped teasing you, but I mean, this this is this is really cool. Yeah, the the Voxel guys won, by the way. We are sus highly sus suspecting that they they've cheated uh, in some way. Uh, okay, and and there is uh, also so that that's. Uh, what you just said is mostly on the Paris side and one very important mandate for uh, Montreal is uh, uh, Maybe you can you can say a few words about it uh, uh, Stefan. Yes me. Um, um, we uh, we were um, suggesting that we the Montreal group um, Revisits and try to improve the certain game loops uh, that seems to be really important especially in the, the start of the uh, of the game experience and uh, we hope to inject uh, even uh, a, a better mechanics that will you know, flow through the mining and, and the building and the piloting. Uh, we want to also, we do know, everybody knows that the onboarding is going to be extremely important because uh, might people, some people might see it like you know, too much to swallow in the yeah. first few minutes. And we're going to be working very hard here in Montreal uh, in collaboration with Paris, obviously, for to improving the onboarding. We want people to be comfortable. They don't want to, we don't want them to be lost and don't know what to do. And so that's going to be one of the main mandates uh, here in Montreal. It is the first hour, let's say, that you spend in the game. This has to be uh, really fun. You get to have the right feedback so you understand how it works, what you can do in the game. You can start to set your own goals and so on. This this is the key uh, for the success of the game. And frankly, I mean, it has not really been taken care of so far. So this this is a, a, a very important mandate of uh, uh, Montreal to actually address this. Let's say this first hour uh, in the game. Yeah. It's even broader than just the first hour because there is, of course, tutorial and just the, the basic first one hour for the player, and then there is general feedback and understanding of yes. every feature for the rest of uh, the player experience, and there is a ton of work to be done on that. Because the players have the choice to really taste a lot of different things in the game, and we want to be able to provide this accessibility to the player to if they want to do certain things they want they need to to find it quite rapidly and so we want the players to be able to taste whatever they want to taste and if they want to continue to continue and if they want to explore different different mechanics to uh, allow them to do so so no it's it's, yeah. it's just just to give a taste of the challenge um, if you consider something quite uh, standard, like suppose you want to do a tutorial to explain how mining is working in the game. Um, well, you have to remember that your universe is a single shard, unique, uh, persistent world uh, that is shared by every player. So imagine you have 1,000 players showing up and they all want to do the tutorial for mining. You, you, you can see that it's not going to work because let's say the first guy is going to go, go and do it and mine whatever we have put there and the second one will not find anything. So you have to deal with that problem. So we're working on that so that we can have, you know, more standard, the, 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 the usual standard tutorial approach compatible with the fact that, yeah, this, this is a sort of a real world and, you know, it's difficult to, to do what you typically do in an instance-based uh, uh, game, for example, or single player uh, as easily.
So, so there's so many different mechanics. We want to have them easy to be used, but hard to master. I mean, all game developers uh, use this model, and this is going to be especially important for us. Easy to use, but hard to master. So there's always a challenge, and you reduce the frustration of, uh, of gamers that are less uh, hardcore. Wow, lots of great information here. Thank you so much. I just wanted to backtrack a little bit back to the Montreal office. I wanted to say thank you to Stefan because the office is beautiful. It definitely put a lot of work into it and it's turned out well. Uh, you know, I sit right in the middle of it all so I get to see uh, all the great people that we've hired so far and there's a lot of great talent there and it's exciting because you know, since we're working every day and working really hard, you get to see the progression and where the game is going. So that's very exciting. Um, and you know what, Eugene? I, I would, um, I don't know, I didn't rehearse this with you guys, uh, but um, um, I would like to do a, eventually an open house. I mean, eventually mm -hmm. uh, I want the uh, the backers, I want our, our guys and girls that are really enthusiastic of the game to have the possibility to come and visit us in a controlled way, obviously. <laughs> uh, it's not going to be every day, but at, at a certain moment this fall or sometime, uh, I'm really, I would really appreciate to have the doors open for uh, the backers that would be in the Montreal area and the ones that will be able to come and visit. Obviously, we'll, we'll um, communicate this in due time, but uh, remember that this is not a closed uh, office, uh, behind closed doors kind of development. We, are, we want to be close to you guys, to the community. We want to show you behind the scenes as much as possible, and that goes into even a, a, a personal visit of our studio eventually. Wow, that's amazing news you heard it here first. I think that's it for the Montreal segment. I wanted to say thank you to everybody who came. If there's anything that you want to say, your time is now before the <laughs> microphone <laughs> is off. I'm going to say thank you to, uh, thank you to uh, all you guys, but also thanks to the community. We will not be here without you. Uh, we always remember that. So thanks, and yeah, talk to you soon in another podcast. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's going to be, uh, there's going to be snow maybe on the floor next time we speak, but uh, <laughs> let's enjoy the, uh, the rest of summer. Perfect. And now back to Paris with NQ Nomad. Hi Entropy. Hey man, nice to be here. Um, it's time to talk about the puzzle building contest we organized uh, recently. Um, we were blown away by many stuff. You wanted to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I think overall we were just really happy with the results. I mean, this was really a case of having uh, quality over quantity. I mean, there weren't many submissions, but the ones that we saw were just totally amazing. Um, I think talking a little bit more globally about uh, this puzzle contest, I think one of our goals when we added all these uh, elements like, you know, data banks, uh, detector zones, lasers, uh, operators, and relays was to sort of create the infrastructure where you could create something like this. It was never something that we fully realized internally. We had done some tests and we had, you know, experimented a little bit, uh, but we never sort of gone out of our way to sort sort of create, you know, a full huge puzzle. And uh, and seeing it realized today, and seeing these, you know, awesome puzzles coming in where they combine all these different elements uh, to create these, you know, fully level designed, uh, you know, almost individual games uh, was just uh, super cool. From uh, from our point of view. Uh, it, it is really cool that you can create these puzzles and, and that was a big factor. But now sort of our, our focus going forward is going to be how can we actually use these elements as game elements now? And you know, we, we know for example that we can create you know, fully functional airlocks and that can be maybe part of a security system in your base or in your ship. Uh, you know, having the interaction where you need two different players hitting two different buttons at the same time to open a door, that can be you know, a big part of how your, your base is set up to give different people uh, different levels of access and things like that. So we're really happy about all of that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, uh, it starts to be kind of a cliche, but we, we say that uh, very often we are blown away by uh, what the players are creating. We didn't anticipate uh, so, so many stuff to be created in the game already at this uh, early stage of development. Uh, maybe you could uh, walk us through uh, some of them uh, that you really uh, appreciated. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there's a couple that stood out to me uh, when I was doing my testing. Um, I think the first one was uh, First Rite of the Neophyte. 
Um, the, I think the first ride of the Neophyte has my favorite moment, individual moment in all my testing, which was when I had to align uh, you know, a 3D voxel sign that was built in the space, and I had to align it to create a shape, um, and there was a cleverly located detection zone so that when I got it just the right place, it would open a door on the other side of the, uh, of the room. And that moment was just super great. Um, the, the second one that I really liked was uh, the heist puzzle. Um, and the heist puzzle to me, overall it was great, but visually I think it was probably one of the best visually. The level design, the rooms, the, the way the building was set up where you would go into these little offices and you had this bridge section where you would extend the doors and you know, all these different little areas that were you know, fully you know, level designed like, almost like an artist, by an artist, sorry. Um, that was super cool. Um, and then the last one was RD Temple. And Artie Temple, I think, is very impressive because I think it was built by only one person. I think it was listed as only being built by one person. And one of the main reasons why I liked this one overall was just due to the simplicity. Um, it was super focused. Everything was very functional. Everything worked. Um, it wasn't too convoluted. You sort of went through it, and it was just a, a total joy. Okay, it's, it's awesome. Uh, yeah, we, we noticed that uh, some puzzle entries were also uh, required to be uh, um, solved by more than one person, so it required two people to act in a certain way to, to figure out the solution. It was uh, very interesting, and uh, maybe uh, we will see even more complex stuff in the future, and that's the point. You wanted to add something? Yeah, I think that was a, a really big highlight, actually, of the heist puzzle. Yeah. Um, when we were going through it, actually having two people sort of going through this huge building with all these different rooms um, and hitting different buttons and asking the other person what was going on, did anything change, did this you know building, uh, did, did this bridge extend? or anything like that, that was super nice. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, the, some entries were also very visually attractive too, so it was clever and really awesome to, to look at. Now, like I said during the introduction of this podcast, uh, it's time to talk about uh, features, and uh, one of the most important part of the game will be the organizations, the equivalent of the guilds in Dual Universe. What could you tell us about this? Yeah, so organizations are sort of the social bedrock for all social interaction in Dual Universe. Um, it's a super high profile feature for us. I think it's one of the most important ones. And we've really taken the time to make sure that, you know, we're doing the right thing. Um, basically, without going into too much detail here, because, you know, eventually I think we'll have a dev blog coming out for, for organizations. Um, there's a couple of core tenants behind organizations. The first one is that any player can actually be a member of multiple organizations. And uh, this is quite new. We, we don't know many games that do this. Uh, but our view is that uh, an organization is basically a social group. And there's no real reason that we want to restrict you in the amount of social groups that you want to be in. Um, you know, the, the, the basic analogy that we generally use is there's, there's no reason why you can't play uh, league basketball but also be a part of the chess club. Mm -hmm. um, the second really important thing about organizations is that organizations can themselves be members of organizations. And this sort of, go this sort of goes into the general hierarchy of how uh, organizations work. And it is up to you to decide how uh, you want to set up your organization and sort of how many levels and the complexity uh, that you want to do for your specific need. Um, our general vision was to always look at the European Union. And the European Union is, can be considered as one organization. And one organization, the European Union, is comprised of many other organizations, such as France, Germany, Spain, Italy, etc. And then those organizations, let's take France, for example, total coincidence. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Um, it can be separated into cities or can be separated into counties, into even smaller organizations. Right. And you can, still, you can keep going down that path until you, you know, up to whatever level that you want to do, uh, depending on what you need. Um, and so th we think this is pretty cool, and this is a, a setup for you to create, you know, very specific groups of people uh, that have specific, you know, needs and rights, and, and we think that's nice. Um, the, the last sort of core tenet of organizations is the voting system. Um, the, voice, the voting system is pretty simple, uh, but basically it is a system in which leaders of any organization will have access to a series of votes uh, for which they can deal with issues democratically. Uh, so, for example, uh, you could have a vote where you wanted to recruit another organization, um, and you could set up to the vote and you could say, hey, I want to recruit this other organization. I think they're pretty cool. And then other leaders of your organization can go ahead and vote and say yes or no, and then that will be uh, sort of safeguarded as a result of the vote. And we hope we're going to start with, you know, relatively few votes, but we hope that as time goes on, we can keep adding more and more and more votes and more options uh, to sort of give you guys that power to, uh, to have that democratic process. Yeah, and um, 
what is uh, important maybe to, to, to say is that it's a, it's a huge amount of complexity. Uh, it brings a lot of depth in the game and it's on purpose. It will require uh, a lot of work and it's also linked to a very important feature, uh, the rights and 2D management system. We're going to uh, uh, talk about that a little bit right now, the RDMS in short. Um, specifications and code-wise, uh, it's very complex for us, so we are actively working on it right now. What could you tell us about these two? Yeah, so the, the Rights and Duties Management System, which I, I will shorten to RDMS from now on, yeah. um, is sort of the second big part that is tied to organizations. It's, it's its own individual thing, but it's got a lot of hooks and a lot of paths uh, that goes into organizations. Um, what you have today, you know, live in the game, is essentially an ultra-simplistic version of the RDMS. You know, you can give a couple of basic rights uh, to use a construct or to build on a construct. And it's sort of very bare bones, and, and we had to do it this way just so that it was functional yeah. um, for, the, for the first stages of the alpha. Our goal from this point is to drastically overhaul and give so much more power into the RDMS system. Um, we want to integrate into organizations, uh, and we want to give you this powerful management tool uh, for you to manage your organizations and manage your constructs and manage all the rights that are going to be coming with those different components. So RDMS currently is broken up into a couple of core modules, and this is the direction that we're going in. Um, the first one is going to be the actors, and the actors are essentially groups of people that you manage. So at a very basic level, you can have uh, an actor, which is your miners, and in that actor group, you can put all your miners. You can have another one, which is your pilots, and in that actor group, you can put all your pilots. And, you know, people can be in different groups, and people can be in all, all many different groups of many different uh, levels of RDMS. Yeah. The second core module is going to be the rights. Now, the rights are the ones that you know. Um, it's going to be, you know, the ability to use something, the ability, the ability to dig on a territory, uh, all these different rights that you can have access to in all these different modules. Uh, today, as I said, we only have a very limited number, but the goal is to drastically augment the amount of rights that you have and sort of split them up into all these different categories. So uh, rights for territories, rights for constructs, rights for organizations, rights for, you know, wallet access, um, all these sorts of different things. And it's re related to what you just said before with all the layers of complexity we will add yeah, absolutely. with the organizations within organizations etc obviously we, we need to have a very powerful system to manage all that yeah absolutely um, and then the last part is actually going to be the tags. And the tags is sort of a generic name that we're using to define a target. So you have a player, you have a group of players, you have a series of rights, and then you have a target. So that target can be a territory, it can be a construct, it can be uh, maybe uh, an organization. Um, and essentially, the whole thing will look like this. You're, you're going to give a certain right to a certain player on a certain target. And by using all of these different combinations and, and sort of having multiple layers of them, you can sort of have this large organization uh, which is going to allow you to have really fine-tuning level of detail to, to manage your rights, essentially. Yeah, so uh, it's also important to say that we want to give the maximum amount of flexibility to organize things properly. But if you also, you, you were talking about democracy earlier, but we will also provide the, the possibility to not act as a democracy for an organization, for example. It's totally possible to uh, act uh, for an organization leader as an autocratic uh, leader, for example. So uh, the, the system is supposed to take everything uh, into account, and that's why I was saying uh, that it was also a, a big, big topic in terms of development for us. Yep. Yeah, I, I think that's, a, that's very well said, and essentially, if I was to put it simply, uh, our goal is to make sure that, to the best of our ability, you can do what you want to do with how you set up your organization yeah. across the board. Mm. Um, and um, concerning the, the, the last part for the, the feature part, everything we, we say here is what we intend to do, uh, of course, for Alpha 3. Uh, we will, uh, we're still figuring out the, the details to how much of that will be available with the, the, the first Alpha 3 that will uh, come later. Um, but we will try to, uh, to pack as much things as possible, of course, but uh, we, we will be more precise in the future. Um, time to talk about the uh, ownership and uh, what we put behind this uh, word. Yeah, I think ownership is sort of like this this general word that we use to define a lot of things. Um, essentially, it's a smaller sub-module, partly of organizations and partly of RDMS, which was needed to sort of solidify uh, those larger systems. And there's two very important things about ownership that I want to talk about today. 
The first part is that um, organizations will now be able to act as owners. And importantly, that means that an organization can actually own a construct. That's a very important part of uh, the system um, so that you know RDMS works with organizations so that you can have organization-owned bases and organization-owned ships, and so that all that sort of coalesces into something that makes sense. Uh, the second big part of ownership, and you know, maybe you saw it coming listening to the first part, but it is the ability to transfer constructs, yeah. uh, something which is not possible today. Uh, you can't really do that today in a, in a, in a correct manner, uh, but now you will be able to. You'll be able to transfer uh, constructs to organizations. That's how you will you know, gift uh, a construct to an organization. So if a player has made a base and then he makes an organization, he can now make it so that that organization, rather than him, owns the base. Um, and similarly, you will be able to con transfer constructs to players. So maybe you're selling uh, a construct or you're just giving one to a friend. Uh, you can go ahead and do that now. Yeah, and everything, of course, uh, is work in progress, and uh, we, we try to advance as um, uh, fast as possible regarding that. You wanted to add something else, or maybe we can wrap this part up. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, for our audience, it's very important to yeah. understand that the, the game is really about you know massive systems and lots of subsystems, and I think it's uh, much clearer uh, today. Thank you very Hopefully, much. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, and uh, now it's time to answer to a few questions from the community. Quidum Azerty on YouTube asks, if two players play long enough, their talent tree will be full and they'll have the same talents. So my question is, would a talent specialization be a good idea to make players more unique talent-wise? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so our, our very explicit goal in regards to talents is to sort of constantly be scaling up the amount of talents in the game. Um, our, our objective is to have really a very large amount of talents in the game to sort of, you know, keep adding some relating to all features and keep having, you know, vertical progression and, and you know, be able to talent all sorts of different things. Um, what we have today is a base rock, and, and it's a solid foundation to, to keep going forward, uh, but the objective is not for players to be even able to ever totally fill their talent tree. Um, I mean, it's possible that it could happen after many, many, many years, uh, potentially, uh, but right now, this is not something that we're super concerned about. Okay, and uh, of course, the player feedback will be critical to adjust everything as time goes by. Um, Quida Mazzarotti also added, I'm not very fond of the benefits of the pilot talent you evoked, as piloting is more a player skill, impacting the hardware of the ship is not a very role-playing idea, whereas, for instance, improving the ship's maneuverability would fit better the role-playing idea. Yeah, so um, if I understand the question correctly, be because of how our piloting is done and how you actually fly in the game, um, there will always be a significant part of the piloting which will be directly tied to player skill. I mean, talents aren't really going to make you a better pilot. They will help a little bit, certainly, but they're not going to be, you know, the you know the, the shortcut to make your uh, your your construct fly great, right? You, you're always going to have that player skill there to sort of tie you down and anchor the you, you know your flying. Um, the talents are, are sort of a supplemental upgrade to focus your character and to have that progression and to have that specialization uh, to make it worth to, you know, have that character and then progress over time. Yeah. Um, Sid Scrig now via YouTube. I'm an architectural student and my crew and I wish to make a heavy industry corp in the game. Is there going to be anything analogous to a CAD program in game? Because as I've seen, it is going to be hard for us to create structures with, say, a symmetrical hollow ring structure that is bored into the ground. Uh, it doesn't need to be anything overly complicated, just something that allows a player to see an overview of a building site placed down, a few basic shapes, and make some sort of blueprint that can be projected onto the ground. Um, since the Alpha 2, I think we have an answer for that. Yeah, so we actually have the uh, the virtual scaffolding projector, uh, which is actually very close to what you're asking for. So the, the VSP allows you to import a .obj file, which you can make with, you know, whatever 3D program you, you prefer. Um, and then you can actually take that shape, import it into the game, and have that projected in 3D inside of the game. Um, you can use that, uh, you know, you can make a couple basic shapes with that if that's all you require and sort of use that to establish where the buildings are going to be, where the tower is going to be, or, you know, where you want people to build. Or you can make, you know, really complex shapes, like, you know, full bases or full ships, and this will allow you to make it a little bit easier to build in groups and, you know, setting up those ground plans and those blueprints for larger constructions. Yeah, and if you're curious about it, you can check it out on uh, our latest uh, Dev Diary on YouTube.
Thanks, Entropy. And now I will answer some of the questions that were asked during our recent Gamescom meetup in Cologne, organized in last August. How does the damage calculation while reentry in the atmosphere work? How do voxel materials and the position of elements impact the damage calculation? We won't give the exact formula, of course. However, we may give an idea of how it works in the future. Next question, will there be APIs outside the game to gather information from the game and to send orders, ideas, uh, inventory stocks, industry status, ship positions and status, crafting items, skills? There will be APIs, but they will be in read-only mode. You won't be able to make actions through the APIs. Um, discussing about which information uh, these APIs will display is too early, as it's something that uh, will be developed after the official release of the game. Next question. When will the energy system arrive in the game, and can you tell us details about how it works? Well, it's too early to discuss this topic yet, uh, and we will make an announcement, of course, uh, when it will be ready. Next question. When will the space cores and bigger cores arrive, and what are the limitations we have to expect? What if by space cores uh, we're talking about orbital core units? Uh, it's planned for soon. Uh, we're currently uh, developing them. And uh, about the bigger core units, um, it's still in discussion uh, as the team is currently um, working on several options to enable players to make bigger constructs. And that's it for the questions. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for listening. Your feedback about this third episode would be much appreciated. Depending on the platform you're listening to us, you can use the rating system at your disposal. Please rate us 5 stars if you liked it, give us a thumbs up or down, leave a comment, anything to help us improving this show. And consider sharing it with your friends too, it's important. Don't forget, you can reach out to us via Discord, it's discord.gg slash dualuniverse, our forums and of course on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. To be sure to not miss anything DU related, we encourage you to like us on social media of course and to subscribe to our YouTube channel and newsletter. The links should be in the description of the show depending on the platform you're using to listen to us. If you didn't back Dual Universe yet and you consider to do so now, we are very happy about it. We rely exclusively on crowdfunding and private money and your support means everything to ship our dream project. More about that at dualuniverse.com pledge. Thanks again for your time, take care, and we'll see you next time.